Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Kuhn Coker, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake. Tonight, we are presenting you with Coming Together on Police Reform Legislative Wrap Up. The purpose of this discussion, this is the last in a four part series of virtual panel discussions, the purpose of which is to facilitate informed civil discourse that will drive and sustain meaningful police reform. The sponsors for this event are League of Women Voters Salt Lake, Better Utah Institute, ACLU Utah, NAACP Salt Lake Branch, Utah Black Roundtable, and Journey of Hope. A recording of tonight's event will be made available to the public by our sponsoring organizations through our website and social media. Other recordings of this event, whether they be in person or on a computer screen, may not be used without the express written approval of the League. The League will only allow audio video of this event to be broadcast in, in its entirety, except by the media reporting on this event. Our discussion tonight focuses on outcomes from the 2021 legislative session, where we made progress on police reform and where progress was stalled. We also talk about how citizens can move forward to promote change. And now I, I will introduce our wonderful moderator. Emily Means is a politics reporter at KUER and co-host of KUER's politics podcast, 45 Days. She has also worked on KRCL Radio Active as a host and producer at KCPW in Salt Lake City and as a municipal reporter at KCPW in Park City. Emily is passionate about reporting on politics through a social justice lens. Emily. Thank you so much, Janine. I am really excited to be here virtually moderating this panel. Um, like Janine mentioned, I'm a politics reporter at KUER and I took an interest in this issue of police reform of course, during last year's protests against police brutality and racial injustice. And so that just kind of carried over to the legislative session. Um, this is the fourth panel on police reform hosted by the League of Women Voters and stems from those protests from last year. But the 2021 legislative session just ended and there were dozens of bills addressing this issue of police reform. So we're here tonight to talk about what happened. This is gonna be more of a conversation than a debate. So if the panelists would like to respond to one another, just let me know so we don't have people talking over each other. Uh, I know that we've got some talkers on this panel, so we'll try to limit people's answers to three minutes if we can, but it's a, it's a loose three minutes. I have three main questions for the panelists, although I'm sure I'll have many more. But if there's anyone in the audience who wants to ask questions, you can do, do so through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, we'll go until about 8.30. So let me introduce you to the panelists tonight. We've got Mark Archuleta Wheatley, who is serving his seventh term as a member of the Utah House of Representatives. He's a Democrat who represents District 35, which covers South Salt Lake and Murray. He currently sits on the Higher Education, Appropriations, Business and Labor, Judiciary, and the Native American Liaison Committees at the Legislature. So sounds like you're busy, Mark. <laughs> um, Mark has been a community activist since the early 80s. He's worked at Salt Lake Community College for the last 15 years as an education administrator. Mark is a graduate of Westminster College with a degree in human resource management. And he and his wife, Josie Valdez, were named alumni of the year by Westminster College. Mark has served on several boards, including Centro Civico Mexicano, and has served as vice president of membership for the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. He and Josie have two sons and four grandchildren. And during this year's legislative session, Mark sponsored three police reform bills and none of them passed. All right, let's move on to Lex Scott. She's the founder of the Utah chapter of Black Lives Matter. 
She graduated from Olympus High School and has attended Weber State University, Utah State University, Charleston Southern University, University of Colorado and Denver, and the University of Utah. She and her husband have two children. Lex's work in Black Lives Matter Utah has been instrumental in driving many of the police reforms we've seen in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, and the state so far. Uh, these actions include peaceful protests, boycotts, canvassing, education, and advocacy with the Salt Lake Police Department and lawmakers at the city and state levels. The organization has worked to integrate more de-escalation training in the Utah Peace Officer Standards and Training Curriculum, and also a ban from police using knee-on-neck chokeholds. Black Lives Matter Utah also had a hand in the many policing and criminal justice reform bills we saw during the 2021 legislative session. Now, Steve Anja Weirden is a 25 year veteran of police work in Salt Lake County. He began his career as a corrections officer at the Salt Lake County Jail in 1991. As a police officer, Steve worked in, in the patrol unit as a detective and as the commander of the Metro gang unit. He retired from the Unified Police Department in 2017 after serving as the chief of police services for the Kearns and Magna areas. Steve is a graduate of Columbia College. He also served on the state's Juvenile Justice Board, its policy committee, and as a member of the Juvenile Justice Reform Committee. Steve currently serves as the training director for iChamps Crime Prevention Center, which is a local nonprofit. He also serves on Salt Lake City's newly created Racial Equity in Policing Commission. But tonight he's speaking with us as a private citizen and not as a spokesperson for the commission. Steve lives in Salt Lake City with his wife, Jennifer Newell, and has taken up new hobbies of distance hiking and urban forestry in his retirement. We have another panelist lined up, uh, Republican Senator Todd Weiler, and he's not here quite yet, but uh, we're hoping he'll join us. Um, Todd is important for this panel because he sits on the Senate Judiciary Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice Committee, and many of the bills we'll be discussing went through his committee. So when Todd gets here, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce him properly. All right, I wanna move on to a legislative scorecard that the League and its partners have created for this session. It's got a list of police reform bills and outlines what they do and whether or not they passed. So that is linked in the chat if you're interested and would like to refer back to it. Um, lots of good information there. And if you have questions about a specific bill, that'll help you understand where it ended up. So I think we can move on to some questions. Okay, we've got one big question to kind of frame this whole conversation. And that is, what was the most important police reform accomplishment in this year's session? And then on the opposite side of that, what was the biggest missed opportunity? And I think we should start with Mark uh, as a legislator who is, who's been working on this. Well, I think uh, some of the biggest accomplishments we had, I mean, we had people talking, we had uh, citizen groups, we had individuals, we had law enforcement talking about particular issues. One of the bills that I especially, especially like that passed is uh, HB 264. It's law enforcement weapons use amendments sponsored by Representative Romero and Todd Weiler. And what it does, it, it, the bill requires law enforcement officer to file a report after pointing a firearm or a conductive energy device uh, uh, at an individual. The bill uh, basically states that anytime you use that gun, uh, that you have to file a report. I like that because uh, we can see it, it helps with transparency. It helps with uh, uh, individuals in our community wanting to know uh, if there's an officer that's always using their uh, guns. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important tool for the community and law enforcement to use. 
And did you say, what was the second part of that question? The second part is what was the biggest missed opportunity? Well, I think there were several missed opportunities. One of the, uh, I was sponsoring a bill, uh, uh, House Bill 283. And what that bill did was put together the same, most of the same individuals that uh, we were working on with during the summer. We had law enforcement, prosecutors, de legal defenders, we had community members, we had Black Lives uh, Matter, we, uh, we had uh, NAACP, we had House and Senate members, and a lot of the bills that were uh, drafted this session were based on those discussions. And so I was extremely disappointed that they didn't want to put that, uh, codify that to continue that uh, because a lot of good things uh, were moving forward and a lot of good things would have continued moving forward if we would have passed some sort of bill like this. It was a, uh, the number one bill from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, from what I heard from the, South, uh, the House, uh, they indicated that they didn't want to move the bill forward, like task forces or commissions that increase the workload of our legislative staff or our legislators, which is kind of odd because everything we do there increases the workload of staff and uh, legislators. So that kind of gives you a background of where I'm at on this on this issue. Yeah. Um, why don't we go to Steve next? Uh, you've been keeping tabs on the session, uh, even though you're you're not a lawmaker up on the hill. What was the most important accomplishment and the biggest missed opportunity? Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for having me, I appreciate participating on this panel. Um, did uh, uh, pay attention certainly to what's happening on the Hill, even though uh, doing a lot of work at the local level. Um, some bills uh, that, that passed that I'm pretty excited about are HB 62, which gives uh, post greater ability to discipline officers may have uh, honesty or ethical issues or there's intentional racial bias. I think those are important tools bring integrity to law enforcement um, and accountability. Um, pretty excited about, uh, oh, it's marked this at HB uh, 264 with uh, requiring that, that thoughtfulness. If you, if you pull one of those two weapons out of your holster, be very thoughtful about doing that ahead of time and tracking that data to see, Mark said not only the officer, there's a trend with officers doing it disproportionately, but also ensuring that um, uh, you know, that we're measuring who, who that's being used against, right? So we can also continue to monitor that disproportionality. Uh, and I, I just really appreciate that data, that data collection. And I'm pretty excited about um, the model use of force uh, policy uh, that will be going, um, that POST is required to do so that we can standardize our use of force, which I think will help bring accountability and integrity to use of force investigations. Um, and then finally, HB 334 with, with mental health training. You know, our officers are trying to address a uh, uh, mental health crisis with limited amount of training. Uh, ideally, we can get um, mental health professionals into that situation, but when law enforcement is confronted with that, they should have the most information possible, uh, particularly since oftentimes they're there in moments of crisis um, which can lead to some of the bad outcomes that we've been talking about uh, uh, over the summer. Um, I do just want to point out a trend that I saw in, in many of the bills and some that didn't pass uh, is that data collection piece. I think that that's a critical part of gathering that information so we know where to put our energy and our focus as we, as we move forward in the future. Um, a few years ago, I did work with uh, Senator Weiler on the Regional Justice Reform Bill. And we'll, there were two big things about that that I thought were important. One is we were looking at our own data about our own kids instead of arguing about um, a trend somewhere else in the country. So we actually had that information. And I think the more of these bills that capture that information to help us make quality policy decisions for the future are better. 
Second thing about that commission goes to what Mark was just talking about with that missed opportunity. And it's that we brought all the stakeholders to the table to have conversations and then drilled down into community as well. So everyone in juvenile justice reform was there. And, and I would like to see something similar to that at the state level, whether it's a formal commission or, or something through CCJJ or something of that nature, where we can have that dialogue and keep this, this energy moving forward. But I think that was in the stuff. Um, thanks, Steve. I would like to get back to that commission with the group. But first, let's introduce Senator Todd Weiler, who just joined us. Hi, Todd. Hello, um, sorry I was late. That's all right, life gets in the way. Uh, Todd is a Republican from Woods Cross. He's also an attorney. And Todd, you've been in the Senate since 2012, right? That is correct. Good. It's, it's like you're a good veteran of the legislature at this point, I think. Yeah. Uh, Todd was also the Senate floor sponsor for several of this session's successful police reform bills. So thanks for joining us, Todd. Um, I actually think it would be great to go to another legislator for this question. We'll kind of go between community members and legislators. So Todd, the question is, um, what was the most important police reform accomplishment in this year's session? And then what was the biggest missed opportunity? Okay. Um, so we passed uh, a number of police reform bills. I'm not sure how many you've talked about. Um, but let me go, it's hard for me to pick one. Um, I, I mean, I really liked the first week of the session, we passed Senate Bill 102, which allows lawful peace, uh, permanent residents who have been here five years to apply for cops. I know that's not probably what you're looking for, but, um, we have a serious recruitment problem, um, for law enforcement and it's been in effect for six or seven years. And uh, everything, every, all of the terrible things that happened to George Floyd and since George Floyd has only exacerbated that problem. Um, I really liked House Bill 162, which provides 16 hours of additional training for law enforcement, including mental health, crisis intervention, and de-escalation control courses. And uh, that bill, in fact, most of the bills we passed were supported by law enforcement. Um, I think of that mother who uh, had the teenage autistic son a couple months ago who called for help. And when the police showed up, they just shot him multiple times. Um, and so I, I really like that bill. Um, and um, I really like Senate Bill 13. And I think this has probably been re referenced, but that ensures that if a, if a cop gets in trouble, um, he can't just resign from his job and then pop up two or three months later at another agency and escape any, um, any um, consequences or accountability for what he did or she did. Um, Senate Bill 68 um, allows the highway patrol to purchase new technology and equipment to help investigate officer involved critical incidents when a firearm is involved. I think that will help us get better data in the future. And um, um, that's probably, probably the best one, uh, the, kind of some of my favorite ones. The biggest missed opportunity, um, it, it's probably hard to say for me. I don't know of all the House bills that didn't make it to the Senate or didn't make it to my committee. Um, so I'm going to probably pass on that one. I do think that, um, you know, I do think that it was difficult that we had a lot of different voices, um, you know, crying, you know, screaming for a lot of different reforms. And um, I think that Utah needed to take a measured report, uh, approach. I think at one point I heard that there were 60 or 65 police reform bills filed. And it turns out that we, we passed about uh, eight or nine. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention House Bill 237 describes when an officer may, may use uh, deadly force. And we passed a bill that talks about when they can retreat from using deadly force especially when it becomes evident that someone is trying to die by, um, you know, suicide with, with law enforcement. Um, so I'm going to have to pass on the biggest missed opportunity because I, I don't know. All right. I'm sure there was one though. 
I'm sure. And Lex, you know, you're an activist in the community. I heard you many times on the Hill testifying uh, during these hearings. So same question, what is the biggest accomplishment and the most significant missed opportunity with police reform this year? Um, well, you know, there's some that I like. I like the juveniles having Miranda right. Um, or being told their rights. I think that's important. Um, I like that police have to file a report every time they pull their gun. I kind of like HB 237. I'm very proud of Ray Duckworth. Um, you know, her, her family member was killed um, when, when um, they called because of a mental health crisis. Um, and reporting... Um, use of force, data collection is very important. Um, the biggest missed opportunity are um, Mark Wheatley's bills, both of them. So, you know, the goal here, the goal, I just wanna let everyone know the goal is that a police reform bill would save lives. Um, that's what this movement is about and holding police accountable for their actions. That's, those are the goals. And um, we can pass fluff bills all day, um, but Mark Wheatley had two bills that were very important to Black Lives Matter um, that were tabled. So Black Lives Matter is now launching ballot initiatives um, for those bills. And we already had planned to do this before the legislative session um, because we didn't have a ton of hope. <laughs> and so, I mean, you know, we sat back and we were quiet about our ballot initiatives, but yeah, Mark had uh, the civilian oversight of police and the body cam bill. Um, and those are so crucial and so important. And, you know, when those failed, um, you know, I, I think I threw a little baby tantrum to myself, you know, like, well, screw all these other bills. My bills, my favorite bills didn't pass. I don't care what happens. Um, but yeah, those are the biggest missed opportunities of the session. Let's talk about those bills because Mark, uh, we mentioned that you sponsored three police reform bills. They all failed. The one would have formalized uh, the DPS commission, but you know, this one that allows cities to create civilian oversight boards. Talk about why um, that was important. And Mark, maybe we'll have you speak to that first. Lex, if you wanna, if you wanna respond in any way, you can. But. <clears throat> to establish, this would have been done by the people. If the people in the community wanted to have a police review board, then they would be electing those individuals to sit on one. Uh, and you can't get more grassroots than the people. And it, it doesn't say you have to, it says if this municipality wants to. Uh, uh, part of the rub was uh, they didn't want uh, current police officers or we, don't, we didn't want current police officers or previous police officers to serve on that, to be totally, uh, um, transparent in the way that uh, if the city decided to do that, that they would uh, be elected and they would uh, look at each individual situation uh, based on what the people believe. And so that is a bill that I thought was pretty interesting because I, I thought that was interesting because I was called a communist And, uh, and then I had another bill that basically kind of did the same thing, except formalized what we were doing during the summer. And the same people that referred to me as a communist uh, said, well, why can't there be local control? The local people should make that decision, which I thought was uh, quite odd. Uh, but Lex, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, the most important thing when it comes to police reform is having independent oversight of police. It is what p 
police officers fear the most um, because police officers, when they commit a crime or a murder, they realize that their fellow officers who were in the police academy with them down the street are going to investigate them and find themselves innocent. 90% um, of police officers are never charged with a crime in a critical incident. And it is a conflict of interest for them to investigate themselves. The theory is that if I know when I commit a crime, like any citizen in the United States of America, if we commit a crime, we know that a jury of our peers will um, sit in judgment of us, right? Um, and what does that mean when, when they choose the jury of our peers, um, our family members are not allowed to sit on the jury, our mom, our dad, our cousin, um, because it's a conflict of interest. And we know that, you know, with the evidence presented, um, if we are innocent, hopefully we will be found innocent. And so we would like independent oversight so that police are not investigating themselves and finding themselves innocent. So it is, to me, the most important part of this. And they shot it down because they're terrified of it. Um, but we're coming for them with a ballot initiative. We're coming. Um, let me jump in here and just remind people that uh, the legislative scorecard we've posted in the chat lists all these bills. So if you're trying to figure out what's going on or what happened and if it passed or not, you can refer to that there. Um, I have two more big questions for the group, but I wanted to go to Steve and just kind of have you respond to that. So the other the other bill of yours, Mark, uh, would have standardized the release of body cam footage. And Steve, I'm wondering if you can speak from the perspective as you know, former law enforcement as to why police would um, would oppose these these two particular bills that uh, would create more oversight for police. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not I'm not familiar with the uh, with the body cam uh, bill that it wasn't passed. Uh, sorry, Mark, for not being on being on that. I think I I think the law enforcement is resistant to community oversight in these technical officer involved uh, critical incident investigations uh, because they are they are challenging. They're there, um, there's a lot of depth and there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail. And I think that losing that investigative uh, skill set um, would, would be something that, that would frighten the officers. And then um, and I'm, just, I'm just trying to balance that against the importance of transparency and, and building trust between community and law enforcement. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around the way to have Community be a part of something like that, but I I don't I don't think law enforcement would be comfortable turning that over uh, completely. Um, so I'm not sure how far how far that bill went, um, but I I do I do think that having law enforcement investigate those is a um, is something that's very meaningful to law enforcement, and I think it's important because it it really is challenging, and I'm um, I, I'm hearing what uh, Lex is talking about. Um, terms of uh, uh, that, that potential bias or friendliness of the relationship being involved in that. And I know there have been some efforts to separate out agencies investigating themselves and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can see that that's a hard one for law enforcement. Let's go to the next question, because like we mentioned, this whole conversation really stemmed from uh, last summer's protests. So what role do you think perceptions about last year's protests played in either promoting or opposing police reform legislation? And I think um, it's interesting to think about the, pers the perceptions fr from lawmakers. So maybe Todd, we'll go to you first for that. Um, 
and I can restate the question if it's now lost in my explanation, but what role do you think the, the protest played in, in this year's legislation? I think that um, the legislature by nature is um, very reactionary and um, without any criticism um, to Representative Wheatley, I think that the House is even more reactionary than the Senate. And so because of, um, because of everything that we saw and endured and experienced last summer, um, we did have a tremendous emphasis on police reform. And I, I wanna also not overlook the fact that in during our one, one of our special sessions last summer, and there are so many that I, they've all blended in my mind, we did outlaw chokeholds, which was one of the, one of the requests that you know the NAACP had had listed on their kind of wish list for states to do, and and I uh, maybe genetic can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that once when we passed the chokehold ban in um, the summer, I think we were in compliance with all of what the AC, NAACP was asking uh, nationwide. Now I understand that um, the Black Lives Matter organization and NAACP, they have different, um, they have different wish lists and different priorities. Um, but I, I, I want to approach this by saying that I don't think Utah um, was in a really bad place in terms of what laws we had on the books, I'm not saying we we're perfect, not saying we couldn't improve. But we did see, like I said, I heard at one point that we had 65 different police reform bills pa uh, filed, we passed nine, uh, I'm sure we'll come back next year and pass some more. Um, I do believe that as the session wore on, that there was some fatigue um, in, the in the legislators. And at, at a certain point, I think some of the leg legislators um, kind of felt like we were picking on law enforcement. Um, I personally believe that um, most police are good. I, I do believe that there's some bad apples out there, um, uh, but I don't believe that it's the majority or, or even a, a large minority. I think it's a very small minority. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm hearing different messages from different um, from different sides. I know that Gallup did a poll last summer of 36,000 people and found or reported at least that 81% of our African of the African American community nationwide wanted the same or more police presence in, in their neighborhoods, in the neighborhoods where they live, you know, and I think that that runs somewhat contrary to the defund the police themes that we heard. And I know that those words mean different things to different people. So I think that the legislature, um, you know, I think if we had been in session last August, that it would have probably looked different. I think that, I think that things had kind of calmed down and some emotions on, for at least some people had um, you know, had been overtaken by other events like the election and the riot at Cap on Capitol Hill and, you know, the inauguration and everything else. I mean, the, the week that we came into session was, the, you know, was the day before Biden was inaugurated. And so I think with President Trump leaving office and some of the violence we saw in D.C., I don't know, I think our people's attention um, got diverted from uh, from what we just saw last summer, and th there were other issues on, on the mind. Lex, how do you think the legislature perceived protesters, and what and and how did that color the way they viewed this this legislation? Well, I will tell you this: I was surprised. Um, there, the protest in Cottonwood Heights that got out of hand. I guess that was last fall. Um, several Democrats told me um, that that their constituents um, had kind of turned against the protesters and um, were in favor of um, some laws that were reigning in protesters, which really surprised me. Um, by the way, I think one of the biggest successes of the session um, was we're not going to allow people to drive over protesters who are blocking the streets. Uh, so I think that is a ridiculous reaction on the other side to I think a lot of this. But I, I do think that um, the legislature was trying to take a measured approach to what happened last summer and not be overly reactionary and not be in a situation where all the cops were going to quit and we wouldn't be able to hire anybody to replace them. So we can we can get to that um, that particular bill dealing with rioting. But Lex, uh, same question to you. <laughs> 
All righty then. Um, I think that um, I wish I could give Todd Weiler some implicit bias training and every other legislator on the bill and, and kind of tell them what Black Lives Matter platform is because I think a lot of legislators make those comments like, um, I think there are good cops and not all cops are bad and bad apples and, and Todd and everyone else. I just want you to know Black Lives Matter doesn't believe that there is any such thing as a good police officer or a bad police officer. We believe that all police officers need to be held accountable for their actions. They need diversity training, implicit bias training, de-escalation training, body cam footage regulation, um, independent oversight of their policing department, and the comment about Gallup saying African Americans want police in our neighborhoods. I'm just gonna go ahead and disagree with that. Um, this is about holding police accountable, making sure that lethal force is not used when unnecessary, excessive force is not used when unnecessary. And, and about the protests last summer, the entire world erupted in anger and being fed up with police brutality in this nation. Um, the entire world erupted. And if citizens in Cottonwood Heights were upset, we don't care if you're upset. We are more upset because our people are dead. And it is time for a change. And the world has screamed out for a change. And if legislators are up there on the Hill saying, oh, they're tired, we're picking on police. Police are paid out of our taxpayer dollars to protect and serve the public. So they need to do that. They need to be held accountable. This is not about their feelings. This is about serving and protecting the public. So. Last summer, the world screamed out for police reform and it led to 60 police reform bills. Then it led to police officers and Republican legislators fighting us on the bills that we wanted and not listening to our voices. Um, but the Justice and Policing Act just passed the House for the second time in Washington, DC. And um, our hope is it will pass the Senate and then that is the entire ball game. Everything that Black Lives Matter has wanted is in that bill and that will be a national bill. And then we won't have to squabble with legislators on a local level. It will be game over, game set match. Mark, how do you think perceptions of the protests impacted your bills specifically? Did that come up at all um, as the committee was debating them? Um, I think so. There, there were a couple of comments from legislators, especially, I mean, one of the uh, House Law Enforcement Committee, uh, we have a police officer that sits on there. We have a, a previous uh, chair of law enforcement. I think he's on the uh, appropriations uh, who was very defensive of law enforcement. And like Lex was saying, this is about individuals being held accountable. It's not about good cops, bad cops. It's about individuals being held accountable. It's just like legislators. We don't have good ones, bad ones. We need to be held accountable for what we do or not do. Um, I believe that that did come into play. Uh, we had a lot of uh, individuals that said untruths who uh, citizens who came on board and testified that uh, you know it was basically us versus them and that's not the intent the intent is let's get together let's talk about these issues let's come up with something that we can agree with and uh, so many times people uh, some people in the community uh, divide us and say it's about uh, cop haters and uh, and those kind of things. It's a, a divisive us versus them approach. And that's not the approach that we believe that we took. Steve, uh, as former law enforcement, how do you, I mean, what was your response to the protests? I know that we're many, we're many months after 
but you know we're still having this conversation um and like lex said it really exploded from from last summer's movement yeah i uh um some of the question is how do legislators feel or how it impacted the bill and, and thanks for reframing that for me i'll leave that to uh people with that experience up on the hill um historically back when i was still working uh, during the Ferguson riots, uh, I was really concerned about um, how little law enforcement took that opportunity to examine themselves and changes that could be made to improve our service and ensure that we um, are meeting the needs of our community uh, through additional community dialogue and and you know in law enforcement that can be pretty challenging to get that honest feedback. Um, some people are very willing to share it, Lex, of course, but, but uh, lots of other you know, members don't feel comfortable coming forward. And, and I think we needed to use some creative ways to get more information and drill down uh, more fully so, so we could meet the needs of our constituents more effectively. And as I, as I saw uh, what happened across the, the country, um, it was obviously a much, much, um, much more intense response from so many more from so many more communities. And I think it has had a positive impact on the need for police reform. I think that that message is out there, that there's good conversations happening as a result of it. Part of it, we discussed how many more bills about law enforcement went to the legislature and specifically about, about reform, right? I also think that um, there, there are people who would not have thought twice about police reform in their daily lives up until these, uh, these uh, protests occurred. So it's happening more frequently and in areas where it didn't, it didn't used to occur. Um, one, one example of that is I was asked to go speak you know, to a seventh grade, seventh, eighth grade civics class about you know, the importance of police reform. And it was a subject that the kids had selected that they wanted to talk about. So it's really, really filtering down and drilling down into more areas, including younger folks. And I think that when the, when the youth are paying attention to what happens, um, as, as they uh, become policymakers and they get more informed on that, there's, there's a real possibility for change. And I think too, um, some of these models uh, that came out of these protests, like uh, Eight Can't Wait and uh, African American Mayors Association Peace Act and revisiting 21st century policing model uh, are, are good frame, a good framework for cities and departments to examine themselves that came out of a response uh, or were revisited as a result of, uh, of, those, uh, of those protests this summer. So yeah, I, I feel like we didn't do enough before and I can see how it's drilling down much more deeply into society this time around. And uh, um, I'm optimistic that, uh, that we can get some positive change out of it. Uh, on, on the other side, we're talking about coming together as a community, coming together and having that dialogue with law enforcement and other stakeholders. Um, I think it's been mentioned, but some officers are retreating away from that, feeling, uh, feeling attacked, and it makes it harder to bring them to the, to the table without that defensive response. So we need to find a way to break down um, the, the, I like the way you guys said, it's not good and bad, it's you're accountable for your actions, right? I think that's a great place to start that conversation. But we need to find a way to share the message with law enforcement, we're not trying to attack you, we're trying to come together and find a way that we can serve our community. So uh, anyway, strengths and weaknesses with, uh, with, or with those. Uh, for my last main question for this uh, portion of the, of the event, I kind of want to dovetail on that idea um, as I was watching these hearings, these bills being debated, it seemed to me like law enforcement had an outsized impact on the Hill. Basically, if the Sheriff's Association spoke against the bill, that bill was not going to pass. So what can members of the public who want police reform do to further their cause if this is, um, if this is, this can be viewed as a roadblock by them. Um, 
let's go to um why don't we start with lex on this one it is so wrong um that a police reform bill has to have the support of police to pass it it is so ethically and morally wrong that you know the chiefs association and the sheriff's association and the fop and the league of cities and towns had to say hey this bill is fine and you know a, a memo was leaked where um they were talking about a bill and they said hey don't worry we gutted this bill we don't have to um you know disagree with it or testify against it and it, it's so wrong it, and it should tell you a lot you know the police reform bills that pass are the ones that were backed by the police and it's like if you're a if you're a child that gets in trouble and you get to choose your own punishment or or you can set the rules so it was highly inappropriate and that's why we have to launch ballot initiatives and if we want police reform we need to pay attention to who voted against our bills if if you know if you're on the side of people pushing for police reform we need to vote people into office who will support police reform and vote those out who fight against it and it you know it's like a 10-year process to get these people out of office but i do believe there's hope and i do not believe that you have to kiss the ring of the police to get a police reform bill passed um and I do believe that this state is turning very blue. Um, so that's my two cents on it. Yeah, it was very disheartening to see the police um, <laughs> pushing fluff bills um, as if we aren't smart enough to know, hey, this bill does nothing. Do not pat yourself on the back for passing this bill that does nothing, you know? Um, and then and then shooting down other bills while also criminalizing freedom of speech of protesters in their next breath um let's go to todd next because you know you you do chair the senate judiciary committee many of these bills go through your committee and you've got both activists and law enforcement testifying uh during these bills so um again what what do you think the public can do to kind of get their message across at the same uh at the same level that law enforcement does on on this legislation yeah and you know in terms i'm going to start with the original question does law enforcement have an oversized imprint i think that um maybe this session they did more so than some prior sessions like i said as the session wore on there became some fatigue and i heard legislators openly saying you know uh, that they felt like um that there a lot of the bills were nitpicking on law enforcement who i think um most legislators generally respect and most of our public respects um and you know i um and again i think that the session um you know it, it has a it has different rhythms and there's different parts even though it's only six and a half weeks but i think by the end of the session i mean i had a i had a harmless resolution in the house that just reminded police that they can't pull over someone riding a motorcycle just because they're on a motorcycle and that got voted down 50 to 21 um so i got 21 positive votes 50 negative votes and that was a toothless resolution but you know my, my sense was that people were tired of 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 bills that were singling out law enforcement. So that not that may not be what everyone wants to hear, but um, I will say this, um, after my 10 sessions, um, you know, when I'm crafting a, a new policy or a new bill, or if I'm evaluating and asked to vote on someone else's, I do wanna know what stakeholder involvement um, has been accomplished. And, you know, I, I heard Lex say that, you know, we don't need um, to kiss anybody's ring to pass a bill. I'll agree with that, but I still want to know if they were involved. I had a, I'm going to just jump off of police reform for a second to make it a point. You know, I had a bill come to my committee and the sponsor it had only worked with a father rights group and it was a father rights bill. And, you know, that bill ultimately, you know, was amended significantly before it, it passed the legislature. So I do think um, mo for, for most areas, 
um, legislators like to see a lot of a lot of buy-in, a, a lot of discussion. Um, you know, uh, Paris Hilton came out and testified about the, um, the the teen industry that you know where parents send their kids to lock them up if they're bad kids. And we passed a bill that dramatically reformed that industry, but most of the facilities um, were consulted for their opinions, and most of them ultimately supported the reform measures. And so, and I saw the police, um, the law enforcement community embrace several of the reform measures that passed this year. And I was the floor sponsor of several of them, including the one that whenever a weapon is pointed at someone, a, a report has to be filed. I'm really excited about that bill. Um, so I, I don't know all the answers. I don't think we're done. I think it's a moving target. Um, but I do think that, um, I do think a lot of, legislators and a lot of members of the public felt like they had to come to the defense of police officers and the law enforcement community because they were being attacked so openly and so publicly. Um, and, and, and I think that that, you know, I think that if that's your method of trying to provoke change and it, it actually did the opposite, I think that there's a lesson to be learned there. Uh, Todd talked about buy-in and having all the stakeholders involved Mark, I'm wondering if you can speak to this a little bit because not, not everyone has equal access or equal buy-in. Um, I remember I was listening to, oh Lord, I don't remember which bill it was, but Representative Paul Ray made the comment that we don't see that the activists here or the protesters from this summer here talking about this bill and talking in favor of this bill but you know there were lex spoke to the bill someone from utah against police brutality did um so i'm wondering if people have an an equal voice in this i guess people have equal buy-in um when we're talking about police reform do you think it just kind of comes down to well maybe these protesters don't know the right people to talk to or um, you know, something like that. Can you speak to that, that uh, issue at all? I don't think so. I think uh, Lex has done a, a phenomenal job in getting all individuals, bringing all individuals to the table and participating in, in various uh, discussions about uh, law enforcement reform. I do think there are some legislators that uh, are very biased. They're very protective of law enforcement. So it doesn't matter what, if you're, if you're sincerely trying to uh, make a change or speak on behalf of the people, they are, they have a closed mind or they don't want to hear it, you know, because law enforcement is being picked on or whatever that, that means. What I find interesting, um, this is kind of shifting away from your question, but I'll bring it back. You know, every year we're told to get our bills drafted early to make sure that uh, they can be heard. But a lot of the law enforcement bills were held for a period of time. I don't know why. And I think that was, the, that was true in the Senate and, and maybe Senator Weiler could address that. But uh, I don't know if they felt that there were too many bills that were, uh, uh, on law enforcement, or, but, but like the bill that I had, 283, that was endorsed by uh, the police chiefs, sheriffs, uh, uh, the governor, uh, Department of Public Safety, and it didn't get a, a, a hearing in the Senate, nor was it considered. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about that. Well, Emily, if you want me to to quickly um, respond that. to that, I, I'm on the Rules Committee in the Senate, and we were we were told that the House um, Rules Committee was was holding bills, and then they were going to release them in batches. I'm looking right now at House Bill 283, and um, it went to committee on February 12th in the the House, um, but then it didn't get transmitted to the Senate. Um, until a week later, um, and then it does look like uh, it didn't get assigned to the committee. So, um, you know, I, I will say I had a lot of non-controversial bills that 
would pass the Senate and would get held by the House Rules Committee. Um, and, and so, I mean, it kind of it kind of goes both ways. I had a bill um, that I passed out of the Senate on February 3rd, and I didn't get a hearing until March 2nd. And for five minutes into my hearing, they gaveled down and the, the speaker was starting the floor time at 4 p.m. on on the second, and I was told my bill died because it, they gaveled down before the committee got to vote on it. So I don't know, a lot of strange things happened during the session. I I wasn't voting, Mark, to, to hold your bill or any other law enforcement bills, but I will tell you the Senate Rules Committee um, was, um, I mean, it was very leadership driven this session and, and there, were, there were some gun bills held um, that far right Republicans are mad about and there were some law enforcement reform bills held that that others are upset about, but I mean, it's kind of the nature of the session, but I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Thanks for addressing that, Todd. Um, and Steve, I, I wanna bring this back to you as well. Um, again, you're former law enforcement, but you're also on the city's new uh, equity and policing commission. What, what kind of input would you like to see from the public or can the public make connections with law enforcement to move any of these reforms forward to get support for those sorts of things? Do you see any any way for them to work together on that? Or is it really, um, you know, as, as Todd has kind of laid out, a lot of people have felt like they were under attack this session. How do they move forward? How do they move forward with law enforcement? Or, or how, does the, how does the public move forward um, from your perspective as law enforcement? Can they, should they be working with law enforcement to, to further their uh, police reforms? Well, I, I believe in a balanced approach. I'll, I'll make another plug for Mark's commission here. I, I think it's such an opportunity um, to, to bring the stakeholders together and that includes, includes community members and then through those have listening sessions where we drill down into other areas for folks that, that may not be an expert on the Hill or, or uh, you know, have access um, to, to directly speak to police departments because they, they can be unwieldy organizations. There's no question about it. But I, I think bringing people together to have those conversations is extremely valuable. And I think specifically as it relates to this question, um, I, I heard Todd, uh, sorry, I caught you in the middle of a yawn there, Todd. And I, I sorry, I, I'm still recovering from the session. <laughs> uh, um, talk about hearing as a, as a Senator wanting to hear all the different voices of all the different stakeholders. And I think it's a way we could have a, a thoughtful commission come up with ideas together that are vetted with all those folks at the table that can go to the to the legislation to the, the house and the senate and, and get evaluated where everyone has had their input and i think that if law enforcement has an, an oversized uh, uh, influence on those bills that that's a way to reduce it by having all that dialogue done ahead of time in the committee before before you get there um, I, I do think that um, community members, my, my, my formal answer on this was state law is hugely important, but there's a lot of other influences out there too. Lex mentioned uh, federal law. There's, there's a big push right now on, on police reform at the federal level. Uh, there's, there's county and city councils and ordinances and policy. And I know... Um, Again, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Salt Lake City Commission, but I know that one of our strategies is to have active listening sessions and try to get access to as many uh, uh, different uh, areas of the community. And, and it's a racial equity and policing committee, so communities of color, to get that input in a safe way so that we can digest all that in making those recommendations. Um, so I, I think as Government officials need to actively look for ways to solicit that information and to get access to that because it, it can be it can be challenging for people to want to go to the police department and say what they have to say. And I I know I said it before, so I think the responsibility is on us to get that information so we can have as many voices as possible, so we can get the best recommendations to move forward at, at any of those levels. 
And then, and then finally, um, Lex is better to speak to this, but there are so many uh, local and national organizations and grassroots um, organizations out there that, that people can join up with to help magnify their voice, right? So it doesn't have to be the government, it's different ways to get that input. So I, I think you just keep trying. We need to keep trying to hear better. And then um, community groups are, no question in my mind, they're going to, but need to and should continue to send that message. Uh, you all have been joining us for our legislative wrap up on police reform. Uh, why don't we go to some audience questions? First thing is, will anything be done to have a more diversified police force across the state? And since this is a statewide question, um, I would put it to our lawmakers first. Uh, Mark, do you have something you'd like to add? To make it more diverse, I, I know it's taken a long time to for law enforcement, I remember way back when uh, they used to have a height requirement and a lot of uh, Latinos were not, they didn't reach that height requirement and women, but they've since removed that and we have more women who are law enforcement, we have more Latinos and we have more people of color who are representative in, in law enforcement. You know, part of the challenge is also when we talk about law enforcement, a lot of us only think about the Wasatch Front. We have legislators, you know, all over the state of Utah and who are part of the sheriff's network and uh, they have unique issues. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how to get more people of color at least considered uh, in that profession, but I did like the uh, Karen Maines bill, and I think uh, Senator Weiler mentioned that, that that passed to allow individuals who are here legally uh, to apply for those positions. And I think that's a good bill moving forward. But I do know that law enforcement has a lot of trouble getting individuals to apply for uh, jobs. And I know one of the issues was pay. We've been addressing that in various uh, municipalities. Um, but I think we, we, that has to be a continual thing each and every year to get more and more people to apply for these positions. And that means going to schools, that means going to university, high schools, and go to community organizations, so on and so forth. Um, if anyone would like to answer these questions, just raise your hand since they are from the audience. If you're particularly keen on one, uh, let me know. Would anyone else like to address this question about diversifying the police force throughout the state? I, I, I would, Emily, if that's all right. The, uh, if I didn't cut somebody else off. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's important for law enforcement to be intentional about outcome and really look at diversity that they have in their department and, and seek to increase that. And I, I think, as Mark said, that can be through recruiting. I think, I think funding and uh, professional recruiters to make, to go out and make access to specifically send the message. We want a more diverse um, police department. We want communities of color to be part of us and look at their policies and their practices may be an impediment for members of communities of color to feel safe coming to the department and look to look to break down, you know, break down those issues, create um, more opportunities in the department to show that, that this is a good job and it is a safe place for you, right? And um, because Senator Weiler was talking earlier about the overall recruitment issue in law enforcement. And I think that while we're trying to adjust to get um, candidates at all, make sure we're intentionally including uh, members of communities of color to have that opportunity to come on and then make sure that our practices aren't intentionally or unintentionally impeding those candidates from getting access to the department. It's hard enough to get members of community of color to apply 
let alone uh, if we're unintentionally setting up roadblocks for their success after we get uh, to apply. Lex, does Black Lives Matter Utah believe that diversifying the police force will help address any of these any of these issues that we're seeing? And Emily, you asked the lawmakers first, but Black Lives Matter has met with the recruiters of the police departments and the recruiters for the FBI to help them increase diversity there. Um, so yeah, we we asked them to go to Black churches. We asked them to go to Black and Brown celebrations. We asked them to go to the African Festival. We asked them... Um, to go into the neighborhoods. And the reason why we need to increase the diversity of police departments is because white male police officers commit the most amount of shootings in this nation, the highest amount of shootings in the nation. Um, and so when we are looking at black and brown officers, we realize they are pulling the trigger less. Um, so it is important to have, um, and due to our work with Mayor Biskupski, we were able to raise the diversity of Salt Lake Police Department by 30%. So yeah, we, we do care about that. But every time I hear that police departments can't get recruits, I have to smile um, because there is no tie. There is no correlation to higher crime rates and more police officers. The other night we did a cop watch um, and we watched 15 police cars come to the scene of one drunk and disorderly Hispanic man. Um, and you have to ask yourself, you know, 15 police officers are here because there is one person under the influence of alcohol. And then the police departments are saying, hey, we can't get recruits. And I'm saying, if you have enough police officers to respond with 15 to a drunk and disorderly, you don't need any more police officers. You're good. Uh, Todd, did you wanna weigh in on this or not? Well, I think that um, statistically, um, law enforcement nationwide is wider, whiter than the communities they serve. I, I don't know that um, that's going to change overnight. Um, but like Mark Wheatley said, Representative Wheatley said, I think that Karen Maines bill, which I actually co-sponsored in the Senate, is, is a step in that right direction. Um, and, you know, I, um, I'll, I'll probably regret saying this, but, you know, if, um, if a Hispanic officer shoots a Hispanic victim or a black officer shoots a white victim or a black officer shoots a black victim, it usually doesn't make the news in the same way as if, if a white officer shoots a, a black victim, and um, um, and, and, may, and maybe that's the right thing. But it is interesting to me. I was just looking at statistics. There were 30 police shootings in Utah last year, and um, you know, 60 percent of of the uh, of the victims in those shootings was carrying a gun or or something that not all the guns were real. I think at least one of them was a fake gun. And I, I, I think it's a mistake to treat every police shooting the same. I mean, the last shooting in Utah was in December and, and the suspect was driving a vehicle uh, at, a, at a high speed towards the police officers, ostensibly trying to run them over. Um, I think that's different than shooting someone in the back when they're running away. And so um, I think it's tempting to treat all shootings the same, but. Clearly, there you know each one is a unique individual and and tell uh, with a unique story and and I, I and I hate to just reduce them all to statistics. Um, I'm going to address that. Um, there were some inaccuracies. The last police officer involved shooting wasn't in December; it was in February. Um, and we I was speaking of the 2020 statistics. Okay, we have over five shootings in February. Officer involved shootings. And we do track officer-involved shootings. The Salt Lake Tribune sent me an email today. They told me I'm not um, at, at uh, liberty to share it, but they did a study of officer-involved shootings um, regarding race, and that will be released shortly, and it is damning um, how often 
black and brown people are profiled by police and shot by police with and, and, and the study that they've compiled shows with and without weapons. Um, so I suggest that everyone pay attention to that. And when a Mexican officer shoots a Mexican officer or a black officer, we track every officer involved shooting at killedbypolice.net. And we realize that white male officers do commit the majority of shootings in this nation. Um, and that again, those are statistics and, and we need for people to understand that yes, systemic racism is real. Police officers all have implicit biases. Racism in policing exists and, and denying it and blowing it off. I need everyone to understand that we are here because people are dead. They are dead. Their families are in Black Lives Matter. Um, these are the stakeholders that are unable to come to testify on Capitol Hill. So um, the statistics are real. Black and brown people are profiled by police. They are killed at a higher rate than white people. And the majority of them are killed by white men. Okay, can I add just uh, sure, Mark. make one comment? When we were talking about recruitment, it's just not re recruitment at a uh, law uh, line officer level. It's also administrative level. So just wanted to make sure that that's heard. Thanks for adding that. Unfortunately, I can't fact check everyone all on the spot, um, but I would like to go to another question from the audience. Um, the question is about holding citizens who incite riot, perform acts of vandalism, encourage others to riot accountable. And uh, there was a bill that, that addressed this issue. Uh, Representative, excuse me, Republican Senator David Hankins sponsored a bill that increased penalties for rioters. And like S Senator Weiler, you mentioned, um, that it would uh, it would revoke liability for drivers who hit protesters. So um, that bill did not move forward, though it did pass the full Senate, but didn't get a hearing in the House. So um, I'm wondering if uh, anyone would like to speak to that particular bill and and some of the other other responses we saw to. Um, rioting and protesting on the Hill this this legislative session. Yeah, I, I heard Senator Hinkins bill um, in my judiciary committee. And again, uh, giving an example, um, he, he partnered at least on the first version of the bill with a group um, that formed after the, um, the quote unquote riot in Provo with the, which involved the, the shooting into the vehicle. And so um, he worked with one kind of, kind of um, counteractive group that formed a kind of pushback on the rioters. And so it was a one-sided bill and I voted, um, I voted against it on the Senate floor. Um, there was some hope that it was going to be amended. It eventually was amended and became um, you know, a better bill or, or at least uh, a less bad bill. Um, but you know, we, you know, when that, I think it was Senate Bill 138, when we heard it in committee, we had like 24 people testify in favor of it, and they were all from the same organization. And so whenever I see um, a piece of legislation where there hasn't been um, a good vetting among various stakeholders, it's just let's partner with one stakeholder and see if we can ram this through the legislature. That's not how we reach the best policy. And you know uh, whether that one organization is a mostly white anti, you know, protest organization or whether it's any one organization like Father's Rights, that's not where we get our best policy. Our best policy is when we have um, a lot of input from a lot of different people. And quite frankly, I'm glad that that bill failed. I think that it wasn't, and just so everyone knows, um, that bill didn't receive a hearing in the House, but you can skip the second hearing as long as there wasn't a negative um, um, action taken in the committee. Uh, but I think the House uh, preferred Representative Ryan Wilcox's anti-rioting bill, a rioting bill. And I think that by the time 
138 got to the House, it had been amended so much that they were similar bills. And I, I think that the, they, they didn't see a need to pass the same bill twice. Does anyone else want to speak, speak on that particular bill or um, the way the legislature tried to address protesting and, and riots this session? They tried to restrict the freedom of speech, um, our constitutional rights of freedom of speech. And I'm pretty sure that one of them revoking our bail passed, right? Um, so was, I think that was in Senator Hankins' bill. And that's- I think it was in both bills. I think she's right. Um, so yeah, the the I know that one of them passed where they're attempting to revoke our bail um, and it's just it's a shame it's disgusting uh, you know black lives matter has been protesting in salt lake and all across utah for seven years without having one arrest without destroying property without inciting violence um, however um, we mourn broken bodies not broken buildings and you can rebuild a building or a police car you can't bring back Bobby Duckworth, Patrick Harmon, Elijah Smith, Sandrea Europe, Dylan Taylor, James Barker. Um, you can't bring these people back. And this, you know, American society has always valued property over lives. And the just the introduction of these bills, I believe, was racist. Um, there were, I believe they set a police car on fire that I was in Minneapolis protesting um, when some people set a police car on fire. And then, um, then some people poured paint on Simgill's office. Again, that was not Black Lives Matter. Um, and the paint was cleaned up by 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, and then they tried to give some of those people life sentences. And so you know, it was, it, it was basically them trying to make us stop protesting. And, um, and, and the thing is, you know, when I've been over here peacefully protesting for seven years, nothing changed. Nothing changed. And I want lawmakers to think about the message that it sends to people like me, Black Lives Matter, who have, have a commitment to keep their organization peaceful and the cottonwood heights um you know we had a protest where we were surrounded by white supremacist militia um that attacked us and how hard i had to work to keep that peaceful even after they attacked us and i want legislators to really think hard about what message it sends people like me who have committed to nonviolence and have never had a riot, have never destroyed property, because I really thought that if I was peaceful and I kept my organizational peaceful, that I could get police reform on the Hill. And then they vote my bills down and they don't listen to us. What message does it send us of how we should act in the future? I want them to think about that. Um, because when you try everything, when you protest peacefully for seven years, and nothing changes and you write police reform bills and you help create police reform bills and you testify for police reform bills and you get on the hill and they shoot your reform bills down. What do you do? What do you do? So I just wanna put that out there and, and I wanna say that these bills are a slap in the face to Black Lives Matter Utah um, to the ACLU, to every other civil rights organization who has committed to remaining peaceful um, at all costs. Um, a man ran at me with a gun. I remained peaceful. Um, we were attacked several times. We remained peaceful. What did we get in return? Nothing. All right. Thanks, Lex. Um, Emily, I just want to point out that the um, Salt Lake County Attorney's Office, after their office was attacked with the red paint, they turned those cases over to retired Judge Dane Nolan, and not, none of those people were charged. Um, well, he reduced the charges. None of those people will be facing life sentences. I want to go to another uh, question from the audience. We only have about 10 minutes left. 
Are there police reforms that have been introduced outside of Utah that show great promise and might warrant a closer look by our community leaders and legislators here in Utah? Why don't we go to um, Steve? If you'd like to address it. Now I'm just assigning <laughs> questions to people, but if, if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, our our, uh, our conditions are going to live review of uh, policies and practices that are, are happening around the country. No sense uh, reinventing the wheel if people are working on good things. And one one thing that uh, I think is showing a lot of promise is um, an altered approach to um, mental health calls. So shifting the um, the, the primary response to certain calls to uh, social workers and other health responders. So law enforcement is not even there in the first place or having a combined model where there's a social worker and law enforcement I think is, a, I think is a good example of that. And it's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, I think too, um, those models that I mentioned earlier about uh, eight can't wait or the, or the peace pact are really good ways to examine your police department and practices and make sure that they have good policy in place. Um, and if not, create the ordinances or the, the policy to make, make those changes. So a couple of examples that uh, I can think of off the top of my head. Anyone else? Uh, policy outside of Utah that might be good for the state? Justice what? and Policing Act. <laughs> Just gonna leave it there. I mean, it's so important. It's so important. And I encourage everyone to write your senators and get it to pass the Senate and, and put some pressure on Biden. Um, it is the dream police reform bill. Can you give and us a quick summary of what it does? It creates a national police misconduct database. It provides qualified immunity reform. Um, it collects data on use of force and police misconduct. It has dash cam and body cam regulation. Um, and my favorite, independent oversight of police. Um, and just everything we've ever wanted in police reform is in this bill. And, you know, it's, it's like we're over here arguing at a, a state level, but if the Justice in Policing Act passes, um, we, we don't ever, I mean, some people might want to pass some more bills, but you know, we, we don't, I will move directly from police reform at that point to criminal justice reform in my work, um, because I will have gotten everything that I've ever wanted in police reform. And, and just to think that this bill could pass next week, um, right? Like it's a big deal. Mark or Todd, um, is there anything nationally that you might consider sponsoring for next year, bringing to Utah? No, I can't think of anything right off uh, that I've heard nationally. You know, because of the pandemic, uh, a lot of times we've had the opportunity to participate with national uh, or with other legislators nationally that you can come up with some good. Uh, potential uh, policy suggestions. And so I, I can't think any, of any right now. I don't know, maybe you can, Senator Weiner. Oh, I, I don't have anything. In fact, um, Emily, asking a legislator about running bills next year, the, the you know, three days after the session's ended is akin to asking a pregnant woman or a woman who just gave birth when she's gonna have her next child. So. Is I haven't even thought about next session. Todd? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, we're coming up on the end of our time here. So I want to put a, a closer question to you. I know we've got some talkers on this panel, so um, we'll give a little bit of time here. But uh, in a sentence or two, what is the next step for police reform in Utah? And give us one bit of advice for how citizens can move it forward if that's something they're interested in. 
And let's start with, um, let's start in the left-hand corner with Steve. I think it's important that we come together and have conversations, right? The, uh, I, I think that law enforcement needs to know the ways that they are not meeting community needs. And I think that there's a perspective that law enforcement also has to share the community, right, about some policing um, techniques or, or whatever. And let's, and let's talk about how we could come together to, uh, to improve that. Um, again, I, I hope um, the state can take some independent action to create in that mission and that conversation about bringing those stakeholders together with access for community have input into that, whether it's through an organization or um, individually. I, uh, I also you know, encourage communities um, to, to host listening sessions with, give access to community members, whether it's in city council or whether it's, it's, it's directly with the police department for those that take advantage of that. And um, I know that we've had good success on the REP with having people call in and give their comments and their perspective about the department. And I, I think that uh, I think those would be some good opportunities to provide that. Representative Wheatley, what's the next step for police reform in Utah and a bit of advice for people who want to move it forward? Well, we have to continue the discussions like we had over the summer with the Department of Public Safety, all the other parties uh, that were attending. I think we started out with around 20 individuals. It, it morphed to around 50 individuals that were interested in discussing and coming up with policy that we could all agree to, those, it, that has to continue. Because if it doesn't continue, it's going to, the, the community's gonna be uh, disappointed, they're gonna be disenfranchised, you know, when you're, when you're asking them to come forward and then nothing or very, relatively little comes forward from the discussions, it's, it, it has a disheartening effect on people. So we need to continue with the discussions. Uh, like I, I mentioned, we were having them twice a month for two to four hours uh, each time. And we came up with some good recommendations. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't have a hearing or didn't pass, but that has to continue. And those individuals who want to be involved, continue, uh, if you, uh, you know, as Steve was mentioning, be, get involved with the county council, get involved with the city council, or any municipality, any mayor form of government, uh, and have a voice. Senator Weiler, uh, next step for police reform and advice for citizens. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know what the next step is. Um, I would encourage citizens to contact their their elected officials. I, I can, I'll be honest with you, Emily, I just ran for re-election last year. I did uh, more town halls and, and citizen outreach than, than I can imagine, than I can count in my head. I represent 120,000 people in Utah, including half of Rose Park. And people were asking me about clean air. They're asking me about COVID restrictions. They're asking me about education funding. I wasn't getting questions about police reform. Now, I only represent, you know, my slice of Utah. Um, but I, I can tell you based on, you know, I had a town hall every single week during the session. These were not the questions that my constituents were asking about. I'm not against police reform. I'm, I'm actually in favor of reform. Um, I also will say that um, I think most legislators uh, look to Janetta Williams from the NAACP uh, for, for guidance. She's been very successful. Um, she had an agenda this session. I think she got most, if not all, of her bills passed. And uh, she, is a, she, she knows how to work uh, in a diplomatic way. She has built relationships with legislators and she is very good at what she does. And you can contrast that with maybe calling everybody names, throwing elbows and accusing everybody of being against you. And one of those methods works and the other one doesn't. 
Uh, Lex Scott from Black Lives Matter Utah, what is the next step for police reform in the state and your advice to the public? I felt like that was Todd Weiler pitting me against Janetta Williams. Janetta Williams and I have sat on several panels together. She has asked me my advice on police reform and I have asked for her, her advice. We don't need white men pitting black civil rights leaders against each other. Um, a lot of legislators have asked for my advice and I've sat on several criminal justice reform committees with senators, congressmen. I met with uh, Senator Mike Lee and Mitt Romney and uh, the tone deaf comments are so inappropriate. So I'll just address that <laughs> real quick with, with Todd Weiler. Um, the next steps I would tell people would be um, look at your legislative officials, you know, see if they're representing you fairly, see if they have a track record on police reform and, and ask yourself, what have they done to support police reform in the past? Um, ask if what they're doing to support police reform, ask them how they feel about police reform, um, meet with your local mayor in your city or county. A lot of mayors are on board with police reform, including East Mill Creek, Holiday, um, Jenny Wilson, Aaron Mendenhall. So meet with your mayors. Um, you can also reach out to your chief of police. I've been meeting with Chief Mike Brown of the Salt Lake Police Department for four years, every two weeks. Um, and also meeting with the FBI regarding police reform. So. I would say, look at your legislative, uh, you know, rep representatives, see what they're doing to help police reform. Um, if they're not doing anything, then call us. We're gonna canvas against a lot of legislators who are too comfortable in their positions. All right, we went a little bit over time. So thanks everyone for sticking with us. Uh, thanks to our panelists, Representative Mark Archuleta Wheatley, Lex Scott from Black Lives Matter Utah, Steve Andrew Weirden, and Senator Todd Weiler. Thanks for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors, League of Women Voters Salt Lake, Better Utah Institute, NAACP Salt Lake Branch, ACLU of Utah, Utah Black Roundtable, and Journey of Hope. And if you missed any part of this conversation, you can watch it on the League of Women Voters Facebook page and also on the sponsor's websites. I'm Emily Means from KUER. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, thanks everyone. Good night.